as the founders of the club, I'd like to welcome you here. Uh, this isn't the first event we've done about WikiLeaks or Julian Assange. Um, in fact, I think it was nearly something like 13 years ago. Um, Julian knocked on our door and he did a press conference. He knocked on our door on a Friday and on Monday he had a press conference about the Afghan warlocks, which I'm sure all of you will know about. Um, so we started doing events here with him and then when he was no longer available, we've continued doing events about Julian for all that time. Um, it makes you wonder. Um, I have, I must say, the most huge admiration for Stella, for Jennifer, and for Christian, for all the support they've done for Julian and for WikiLeaks. Um, it's been tireless, and I must say I really admire them, particularly Stella, for this extraordinary... <laughs> It's hard for most of us to even imagine the stress and the difficulty that every day must be for her, so I'd like to recognise that. Um, tomorrow, Julian, again, is in court. I'm not entirely sure whether he'll be allowed to be there or he'll be on a video link. Um, and um, it just occurred to me that it's not just Julian that is being scrutinised. I think it's the court that's being scrutinised. Julian is clearly a political prisoner. And it strikes me that in our country today, in this country, there's such a level of civic dishonesty. You have to wonder where that sort of thing comes from. And if the court is being employed, as it is perceived by me to be employed, as a vehicle of lawfare uh, for the powerful, for our political masters, to remove somebody who they feel their voice makes them uncomfortable. This is what perhaps promotes, as much as anything, um, those that sort of dysfunction in our country that we see that's so rapid, what I call civic, civic disorder, the sort of civic dishonesty. Anyway, with that, that was all I have to think about it, and you're not here to listen to me. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand over to Chris Hedges, who will introduce the panel. Um, and thank you very much, all of you, to coming and discuss it. Thanks. And I just have to say, coming back to London, it's always hard to come back and not see John Pilger. Um, and I just want to mention his name. I was walking by a discount clothing store. I'm embarrassed to admit this. and saw a white linen suit uh, and bought one. And my wife said, when are you ever going to? But I did it uh, just to remember in a funny way, John, who could be totally irascible and impossible at the same time, but um, was an amazing journalist and really got what was happening to Julian from the beginning, and just did not let go with that kind of doggedness and brilliance. And he was a beautiful writer, so I just wanted to mention him as a journalist tonight. That, you know, he's kind of here. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not going to butcher your last name, Kristen. Oh, you're welcome to me. Haraf, you're <laughs> Uh, Editor-in-Chief of WikiLeaks, Jennifer Robinson, uh, Human Rights Attorney, Stella Hassan, you all know, also uh, an attorney. Um, and uh, I guess we're going we're gonna to run for about an hour and then open into questions. Um, maybe we should begin, because even I have questions with uh, you, Stella, and Jennifer, just from the legal point of view, because the court never tells us anything. Um, so, you know, we all kind of uh, are, uh, you know, wait, uh, you know, for deus ex machina to appear out of the sky with some decision, we never know when, but maybe you can, uh, I'll let you start, Jennifer, and then you, Stella, just lay out legally where we are and to the best that you can, what you expect. Well, first, thank you, Chris. Thank you for your work, and thank you for raising John. And I do think it's appropriate that we do talk about John. And I just want to share a little anecdote about him before we kick off. John was there at the very, very beginning. He was rallying people to, to post bail for Julian. At the very beginning, he was rallying other Australians in London. We talk about the Australian Mafia. John was really at the, at the forefront of that in rallying support for Julian right from the very get-go. He was invaluable to us as Julian's legal defence team at the outset. In garnering that support and continue to be so I really want thank you for raising him and I'm sorry he's not here with us 
the the appeal this week is Julian's last appeal in the United Kingdom and we're seeking permission to appeal so you'll remember we won the case back in 2021 on the narrow grounds that Julian's on the on the basis of that it would be oppressive to extradite him because of the particular prison conditions he would face the oppressive darkest black hole of the US prison system prison conditions he would face combined with his mental health picture depressive illness and autism diagnosis that he would be caused to commit suicide that is the accepted medical evidence before the courts of this country that if he's extradited to the United States, it will cause his suicide. Um, it couldn't get more serious than that. The US then offered an assurance, a conditional assurance, which is even an assurance is not worth the paper it's written on from the United States, as Amnesty says, and then it, in this case it was conditional in that at some point in the future they won't put him in those particular prison conditions, but they will do if he does anything to deserve it, and the people who decide that are the intelligence services who tried, who wanted to kidnap and kill him. So the intel intelligence service who have the power, who wanted him dead, have the power to put him in prison conditions that will cause his death, and we have no ability to judicially review that. Nor did the British courts in this country allow us the opportunity to test that assurance before a court at an evidential hearing. So it's extradition by diplomacy. That's where we got to. We're now appealing the decision to extradite him on that basis. Uh, we're appealing the Home Secretary's decision and the decision of the district judge to, to all of the grounds that we lost at the first instance. So you'll be hearing from us this week on free speech, that this is an unprecedented prosecution, it's, the Espionage Act has never been applied in this way to a publisher and a journalist. The fact the US is exercising extra, extraterritorial jurisdiction over Julian as a journalist who was publishing information outside of the US and yet will not give him constitutional rights at the same time. Uh, the, free, the fair trial aspects of it, that he won't get a fair trial if returned to the US. Um, the fact that once extradited, the US could add additional charges that could expose him to the death penalty. These are the arguments you'll hear this week, but if we are unsuccessful in getting permission on even one ground, that's it. This is his last appeal in the United Kingdom. We will not be going to the High Court. We will not have recourse to the Supreme Court. Our last attempt at appealing to protect him from extradition is the European Court of Human Rights. <coughs> And to say a quick word about that, if we lose this week and we have to go to the European Court, it is not a given that we will get provisional measures to protect him from extradition. It is an exceptional measure. There were 63 similar type applications made to the court last year in deportation and extradition cases. One was granted. And we all know what happened when that one provisional measure case went forward in Rwanda, the political backlash that we saw in this country towards the European Court's jurisdiction. So... Julian could be extradited, and very soon, and that's how serious it is right now. You have a law degree, come on. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think the, the big picture here is that uh, Julian hasn't even been able to appeal. Um, it was his permission to appeal that was rejected, and that's the decision that we're trying to overturn. The High Court, which is the second of three levels, um, didn't even want to hear his arguments. We put in an, an application that was uh, 152 pages long, and it was rejected in a, in a three-page decision, which didn't engage with any of the arguments, simply said there was no arguable point uh, of law um, Julian should have been granted an appeal on each of these of the points that we raised, uh, and none of them were granted, and it was dismissed in a very um, disturbing manner. And uh, one has to understand that this is a political case. Um, that the courts are not behaving in a predictable manner. In fact, um, we have to prepare for uh, the worst case scenario. There's no point preparing for an optimistic scenario because when you consider what an optimistic scenario would be, i.e. him winning this round, it would only mean that the court has agreed to hear an appeal on one of the points or several of the points and many more months if not years in Balmarsh prison. Um, 
punishment by process. Yeah. yeah. Stella, just if you could run through quickly the litany of legal anomalies that have defined this process from the beginning, um, any one of which should see this case thrown out of court. That's what's always stunned me, starting, starting with UC Global and filming the, or recording the meetings with attorneys destroying attorney-client privilege. In, in any court of law in Great Britain or the United States, that's it, the trial is, and yet they just violate their own rule after rule after rule and that, that has always struck me. The, 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 you know, I don't know whether to call it farce or pantomime or what. You know, it's a, it's a show trial. And when you get into those details, which maybe you can just lay out a few, it becomes completely apparent um, that this is not a legitimate judicial process. I think that's absolutely correct. It is pantomime. Um, Julian's imprisonment is done through legal sleight of hand. The extradition itself doesn't deal with the merits of the case. Um, we can't interrogate uh, the uh, veracity of the statements of the prosecutors who have completely uh, misrepresented uh, WikiLeaks um, activities and, and actions and publishing. Um, they've, they've brought an Espionage Act prosecution, for goodness sake, uh, for the most important material uh, that journalism has ever seen as a, as a compendium of, um, of state illegality and torture and systematized uh, arbitrary detention and, and civilian killings and the horror and, and uh, catastrophe of the Middle East, of the wars in the Middle East. Um, so... This, this prosecution should never have been brought in the first place. Um, but once it's brought, it's a bit of, a, it's a, bit of a, a trap, because once you engage in speaking about the process, you sort of legitimize it as you go along. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're, you're caught in a, well, surely he'll face a fair trial. Hold on, can't possibly face a fair trial if the case should never have been brought, because what the United States is doing is criminalizing journalism, um, and there's no public defense, and there's no, you know, so 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 it, it's kind of channel, channeling Julian into um, a state of perpetual defenselessness, um, and this is this is kind of the the some of the difficulty that that we face that the violations are so egregious that you're almost, you're not even speaking the same language. Uh, the, the, the spying on, on Julian's legal meetings with his, with his lawyers discussing his defense strategy and so on, his, his legal documents were shipped off by Ecuador to the United States, um, the, the plans to assassinate him, um, and it's met with non-engagement because it's just so um, it, it's so extreme um, so in a way when when we're when I'm asked about the process or you know what happens next or well what happens once he faces trial in the United States it's like for goodness sake he's facing 175 years can one meet even who can entertain a the argument that, that he could possibly face a fair trial under any circumstances, if you take that even in isolation. So uh, this is a bit of the, it's, it's kind of a, a little bit like when Julian was inside the embassy and I thought, how do you possibly translate the situation into the, into, in a language or in a way that people just walking down the street would understand and, and believe. Um, I think we've got through a, a set of pretty extraordinary um, things that have happened, whistleblowers, 
um, in Spain actually giving physical evidence of what was going on inside the embassy to Spanish police who then raided um, the security company, obtained hard drives with conversations with Julian and his lawyers evidencing this and then, um, you know, uh, emails with instructions from, from the United States in English talking about how to how to spy on Julian without the Ecuadorians knowing and you know just such a such a huge body of evidence to show that this was actually happening and then an investigation in the US that then prompted this disclosure about Pompeo plotting to assassinate Julian um, and then the lawsuit now against the CIA uh, which the CIA is trying to shut down by invoking state secret privilege. Um, so it's quite it's quite a it's quite extraordinary really that we have a case where we know so much. Um, but translating that into a way where that public awareness is really. Uh, there, uh, that, that's the challenge. Well, we'll talk to Kristen. I think the problem with translating it into public <coughs> awareness is that the press has not done its job. That's pretty obvious. They have come around a little bit at, uh, in the lead up to these two days. Uh, there seems to be awareness now that this is, a, is about them. It's about uh, their work environment, and they seem to care about that. Uh, but you have to remind them this is not about journalists, it's about journalism, and uh, and in the end, of course, it's about the people's right to know. And, uh, th that realism is, is, uh, is sort of slowly getting getting there, I, I feel. So I, I'm really hoping that the focus uh, tomorrow and on Wednesday will be on the court. As Juan said, it's very important that the, uh, the courts uh, will be scrutinized and the, the proceedings there. Um, the uh, and mind you have to mention that the fact that journalists are having a really hard time actually getting access live streaming from the court is denied to everyone who is outside England and Wales for some reason uh, so it, it is it is it is like they they don't want the scrutiny so the realization is there they are they have, they have been constantly trying to block access reporters without borders I mentioned the case of Julian Assange as uh, the worst case that they've been trying to monitor in any country. I mean, they've been going to Turkey, other countries. The problem of being an NGO monitoring the Julian Assange case has been bigger and worse than they've, they've experienced in all these other countries. So it speaks volume about the case and, and the entire thing. Uh, yes, of course, journalists should have uh, been more agile and scrutinized the entire thing. There was still we're still seeing popping up. We're still having to shoot down this conception and part of the slander that had went on for years and years and years. Uh, just this morning, I saw a legal expert on, on, on one of the television stations here in the UK uh, talking about the so-called assurances or something that was something to, to hang your hat on. A law expert. Uh, and, <laughs> and for heaven's sake, the Amnesty International scrutinized it, and as Jen said, said it was not worth the, uh, the paper uh, that it's written on. Uh, it's uh, it's a, you know basically assurances that they will treat him fairly. It's a, it's a statement. It's a diplomatic statement. It has no bearing in the U.S. And uh, the, the Bureau of Prison in the U.S. is notoriously independent. Uh, John Kiriakou, the CIA whistleblower, told me the story that you know when the judges, in his case, when he did a plea pardon, a deal, uh, uh, recommended he would be put in open prison for the short period of time that he had to serve. But the Bureau of Prison said, well, uh, we don't care what the justice says, we're independent. The only organization that has a say in how Julian is treated in the U.S. prison is the CIA, mm. the very agency that had plotted to <coughs> kidnap and assassinate him. That's how severe it is. So this document, the so-called assurance, is, is, is not is worthless. And I, I must say that, that from a judicial perspective, I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer, but, but from a common sense perspective, to be allowed, even in an appeal court, without sending the entire case back to, if it was so important, it should be heard in entirely on a lower, lower stage, because it changed everything. To overturn a decision on the base of this piece of paper just shows how 
utterly, utterly bent the system is, and how you just cannot rely on it. And I've lost all faith in it. I have to say, the only inkling of a, of a, of a chance that that these two judges will overturn the decision of their colleague is if there is a powerful public pressure, powerful scrutiny, and uh, of course that possibly the politicians will wave their hands and say, no, we can't go any further. This well, is becoming an embarrassment of, to this country, which it is. And it is an embarrassment to this country that Julian Assange is lingering in Belmar's prison for almost five years. I want to ask you about the CIA in Vault 7 because I think that was a turning point, but yeah. I met Julian through Michael Ratner, who was representing him. Michael was a very close friend of mine yeah. and a wonderful human being and just a courageous lawyer and amazing um, guy. But he always told me, and he did, he was the one who got representation for the people in Guantanamo. I mean, he just had this long, amazing career. But he said, it's without the people in the street, I can't do my job in the courtroom. I can't. There has to be that pressure to essentially wake the judicial system up. I want to ask, and I'll start with you, Kristen, about Vol. 7, because uh, the Obama administration decided not to uh, ask for Julian's extradition for what they call the New York Times problem. The New York Times problem, which was the Guardian's problem, and El País's problem, and Le Monde's problem, and Der Spiegel problem, is that in partnership with WikiLeaks, they published the same documents. Uh, and that's why we had all this charge, that uh, false charge, that Julian was trying to assist Chelsea Manning with getting because they needed something else. That changed after Vault 7. The Trump administration crossed the Rubicon. Instead of charging whistleblowers who had provided information to the press, uh, and Obama was very aggressive about this, um, the, the Trump administration charged the journalist with espionage. Just explain, I mean, it's always my reading that um, that the engine now behind the extradition is the CIA. Um, explain what happened with Vault 7 and how things changed after Vault 7. Why don't you start, Kristen, and then maybe you all can come. I, th I think you're correct in that evaluation. This is the, 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 uh, the, the driving power behind uh, this uh, persecution of Julia now, is the intelligence community uh, or, and or the military intelligence interest in the United States. They are the, these are the, the powers that, that want revenge and they want to see him dead. It, it, it's, it's as obvious as that. Uh, the Vault 7 release, which was exposing the, uh, the, uh, the, the cyber tools of the CIA, how they could basically break into your telephones and your, your cars and uh, computer system. And Even when they're off. Sorry? Even when they're off. Even when they're off, yeah. Um, uh, and it was obvious they had a public interest to expose that this was in their arsenal. It was the most embarrassing leak in, in, uh, in, in CIA's history. And the fury was obvious. And uh, you have to remember that at that time, uh, uh, Mike Pompeo was the director of CIA. This is in the early years of 2017. And shortly after, in his first public uh, uh, sort of speaking engagement, he went to the podium and talked about the, the, the gravest danger facing the United States of America, which was Al-Qaeda and Wikileaks, the journalist organization and Al-Qaeda. And it's then when he carefully turned to this uh, um, definition of Wikileaks, and it was, we didn't realize that at the time, I did not realize how serious this was when he said, this is a, uh, um, Wikileaks is a non-state hostile intelligence service. Nobody, everybody dismissed it as, as being sort of hot air at the time, but it was not. It is, it was, the lawyers came up <coughs> as a legal definition that they could hang their hat on in the assassination plot, because you can kill a foreign agent that is hostile, right? That's what, that's, that's what CIA does, it, it kills people, right? So... And of course, later that plot was, was, was realized and discussed in the highest chambers of power in the White House um, and given a go. So that was a, a, a turning point. And I think that this is still the power that we are facing, more so than President Biden, Secretary of State Blinken, or Attorney General Garland. <laughs> it is that power, you know more about the details of how that works on the inside, uh, uh, I don't know fully the entrails of it, but uh, we have uh, past history to rely on to see what the 
effect it can have. So that is the that is, in my opinion, uh, the 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 dynamics and the politics that is pushing this case and uh, and the reason why we we have Julian Assange as a political prisoner here in London. Just to add that the, the Trump administration was actually very, very transparent about the shift um, in their, uh, I forget exactly which document it was, but it was kind of their national threat framework type, the way we see the next five years. And they identified hacktivists, leaktivists, and public disclosure organizations as their greatest threats. And of course, Julian and WikiLeaks fell into the third category um, as, a, as a threat model to, to the Trump administration, public disclosure organizations. Basically mentioning pillars of democracy as a threat to the administration. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just on, on the CIA point, I, I will never forget uh, getting off a plane in the United States to the new to reading Mike Pompeo's comments, and it was immediately clear to me what they were doing, which was to use these semantics to create a new category for WikiLeaks that would allow them to pursue WikiLeaks in a different way. And it's similar to the kinds of semantics we saw around Guantanamo Bay. Uh, and thank you for mentioning Michael, who's a dear mentor of mine. It's, it's a sad reflection of how long this case has been going on that we've lost so many friends along the course of it, Michael Ratner being a really important <coughs> one to me and to Julian. Um, but as soon as Michael Pompeo made that statement, I actually gave a speech with the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, David Kay, at UCLA that, later that day. And I stood up and said exactly that. This is exactly the kind of semantics we saw the Bush administration engage in around Guantanamo about unlawful enemy non-combatants. This new, these new phrases that did not exist under humanitarian law, which were invented, <coughs> to lock up people in Guantanamo for a really long time. And when I heard this language, I immediately said, they are going to use this to pursue WikiLeaks. This is a new kind of language which they will use to make it possible to prosecute Julian and to cross this threshold. I used those phrases in front of the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, and within days, Jeff Sessions, the then Attorney General, came out and said prosecuting Assange is a priority. And that's when the drums really started beating for this indictment. So I think we have to... We have to look at this indictment, and we tried to argue this before the court action, the extradition case. This indictment was driven after the CIA publications. They're prosecuting him for what happened before, but the impetus to prosecute him came under Trump after WikiLeaks published the CIA publications, and Mark Pompeo was gunning for this. I want to ask about the British courts. So within the American court system, the CIA is virtually untouchable. Um, they have all sorts of legal mechanisms uh, anti-terrorism laws, SAMs, uh, you know, Immunities. immunity, everything that essentially makes them untouchable. But we see, and I, I think all of you are right, that this is being driven. How do they exercise that kind of control within the British court system? I'm not sure to say that they exercise that kind of control. What's been concerning is the way in which the court rejected our arguments about abuse of process, raising these issues. So I was spied on as a lawyer. I've seen recordings through the context of the Spanish criminal proceedings of my meetings with Julian, videos and recordings of my legally privileged meetings with him. I have had to sue the British government for spying on me, which they settled. Um, not just spying on me, but spying on me and information sharing with the United States as a result of the Snowden disclosures, which they settled. Um, but if we look back historically, for example, at the prosecution of Daniel Ellsberg, the Pentagon Papers leaker, he was a, a whistleblower, not a publisher, but prosecuted under the Espionage Act under Nixon. What had that case thrown out? Breaking into his psychiatrist's yeah. office. That was sufficient under the Nixon administration to have the entire case thrown out with, with prejudice, which meant they could never bring it again. In our case, spying on Julian's medical appointments, spying on us as lawyers, seizing legally privileged material, the list goes on and on and on <coughs> of the abusive process. And what does it say about our democracy today that us raising these arguments went nowhere in the British courts and that this, in, this prosecution continues in the United States when there's been far more abuse than what we saw under the Nixon administration, what does that say about our democracy today? Well, I'm, I'm curious because it's just a given within the American court system that the CIA is untouchable. 
and, and, and is the British court system now so decayed that it, it just bows to any form of pressure, or is it replicating the kind of power the CI has within the American court system? I guess I'm asking a question about what's, what is happening within the British judicial system in terms of it's, uh, it's, it's clearly dancing to the tune that they play, and I guess I'm asking why. Um, is it just because the coal system is decayed, is it, or is it, I mean, the American judiciary is, you know, not in good stick shape, of course, but you, you, it's just we know as a reporter, you can't, if, if you can't go up against the CIA. And what, what's happening internally, as far as you can tell, I guess I'm asking both of you here. Well, I, I think things are a lot more open in the U.S. than there are, they are in the U.K. Um, just beginning with a, a cultural skepticism of um, too much state power. Um, even in popular culture, when you see the intelligence services uh, portrayed here, they're usually portrayed as competent, um, you know, admirable, honorable, uh, all these things, whereas, yes, there's some of that in the US, but I also see a lot of um, popular culture where the CIA are the bad guys. Um, you don't have that so much here. Uh, and uh, I think there's a, things are a lot more sewn up here, I think, um, and it's less transparent. Um, Starting with the, um, well, Declassified has done a lot of work looking at the at the uh, judges involved in in this case, and um, I, you know, I have to be careful with what I say uh, because we're going before the judges tomorrow. Um, but have a have a read. Um, there's, uh, it's very small. It's a small world at the top um, uh, of, the, of the establishment here. Um, and it's very integrated, and Julian offended uh, all those networks. Uh, so I think there's, there's some of that. And then there's also kind of a, a practical aspect, which is in extraditions, uh, you know, it's... it's 99% politics, if this were Rus a Russian, Russian extradition request, um, it, would, it would have been thrown out from the get-go. It wouldn't have been certified. Uh, you know, a, a, a journalist publishing evidence of war crimes committed by the state in the context of a war, um, and then the Espionage Act being used for receiving, possessing, communicating information about war crimes to the public received from an insider who was a whistleblower. I mean, you can't even, it blows your mind to even uh, transpose that situation into uh, a different country. But of course, it's the United States. And there are all sorts of internal arguments that are involved. Like, of course, we trust, we have to trust our close, you know, uh, friends in the United States and the integrity of the judicial system and if there was intelligence uh, interest in them as, as, as the judges kind of uh, um, uh, referred to the CIA assassination plots, interest, intense interest, of course, um, uh, then uh, we're not going to question that. And so they're, they're, it's, it's just kind of a they revert to a formulaic uh, get out uh, because they're our friends and our friends are fair democracies that, that don't do bad things and of course um, everything everything we know contradicts that right beginning from from the torture the torture program to black sites to Guantanamo Bay and so on. Like this is this is a country that has found a million different ways to break the law and to break international law and undermine the uh, international legal <coughs> system and to 
and to torture and to kill and so on. That's who we're dealing with, but you're dealing with a kind of dual register. And to a certain extent, I wonder how much of it is careerism. Um, they know if they render the decision is that the state wants, it's very good for their career. And we have seen judges, I think of, I don't know how well you know, the Attic uprising is in the UK, but the, there was, uh, you know, those who stood up for, this was the broke into a prison, killed 39, shot dead guards and prisoners. And, uh, but you know, judges that they were just, their careers were destroyed um, and uh, declassified has, as you point out, uh, detailed the links with the defense industry and, you know, you know, so it's, it's a select group that is embedded within the intelligence services and the defense industry, but also um, <coughs> they know the cost. I don't know what you, you think, Jennifer. All I'll say, as counsel who will be in court tomorrow, <laughs> um, yeah, I'll say, <laughs> is that those who end up being appointed to the judge are typically establishment, to, to, to end up in a position where you're appointed to be a judge. And so the judiciary tends to be rather conservative. Oh. <laughs> Let's talk a little, I want to talk a little bit about the press. <laughs> Um, and I think following this over the years, the, and I just want to say coming out, I worked 15 years for the New York Times, coming out of that culture, um, for people who don't come out of those institutions, it should be clear that from the inception of the 2010 Iraqi war logs, uh, those within institutions like the New York Times loathe Julian Assange because he shamed these institutions into doing their job. And they had to print that material because if they didn't print it, they would be exposed as lapdogs to the elites and stenographers to those in power. And this has traditionally been the case. So that's why, and I've heard people raise it, you know, after this information was published, you saw the first probably institutions that began this long character assassination um, were The Guardian, The New York Times, my old editor, Bill Keller, and others. Um, and this letter, which is good, that was published by uh, Le Monde, uh, I, my understanding is that was pushed on them by the, by the lawyers, who said, uh, you know, this is not to uh, call for Julian's release as suicidal. Um, if Julian is extradited, if he is found guilty, uh, then, and I published classified material in the New York Times, just to possess classified material, much less to publish it, 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 it becomes criminalized. It's the death of investigative journalism into the centers of power. It's over. It's finished. Um, but I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the... Uh, you know, the consequences uh, for the press from this case. And I think that that is what got a lot of us initially uh, who saw it behind it. Let's talk about, you know, what, God forbid, let's say Julian is extradited, let's say he is found guilty. What does that mean for the press? And, and, and just one more thing, watching it from the United States, you're watching a journalist who's not American, who WikiLeaks is not a U.S.-based publication. Uh, he was not leaked the materials in the United States. And it's this message that you can seize a journalist, no matter who they are, no matter what nation they're from, no matter where they are, and through what the euphemistically called extraordinary rendition, I think the consequences for the press are absolutely terrifying. And maybe we can start with you, Kristen, and everyone can address that issue. Yeah, I mean, the precedent uh, being set uh, is dawning on, 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 on journalists probably gradually. And it is the, the reason, of course, when we, we had to rather a turnaround in, in to support by our former media partners uh, back in 2010 and 11, the New York Times, the Spiegel, and uh, the Guardian, and others who were part of that uh, 
um, Media Alliance uh, pushing out to the uh, uh, publishing the, uh, the the Iraq war logs and the diplomatic cables and the Afghan war logs earlier. It's it's out of self interest. It, it is dawning on them, and the the, the precedent is, is is extremely serious. Uh, and for some reason, for example, here in London, we had a meeting last week with the Foreign Press Association with over a hundred journalists. Uh, the the foreign press in this country seems to get it more than the local journalists for some reason. They do understand, uh, even f uh, coming from countries from the, with shakier past and, and dictatorships and living memory like Latin America, they do understand what this means. And, and, and it, it is serious. And, and, and that is the, this precedent is, 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 is so chilling. But I've, I've, we're all, always talking about what if he is extradited. And I just want to mention the fact that the persecution of Julian Assange has already had a serious chilling effect. And it has already set an example for others from less democratic countries, for dictatorships, to go after journalists. We do have, uh, we, we do have examples from China, from the Azerbaijani president, and from Russia, where they cite Julian Assange as an example, why do you think you can criticize us when you have Julian Assange sitting in prison? This is the exact word of the Azerbaijani president who shot back and fired back at a BBC reporter. How can you criticize me for lack of press freedom when you have Julian Assange in prison? So that, that, it, that is the bad inspiration they get. And uh, you have Evan Gershkovich sitting in, in prison in Russia being charged with espionage. What is the difference between Julian Assange and him? And uh, so Julian Assange is a prison, a prisoner, a political prisoner. And we saw on Friday what can happen to political prisoners in other countries. So it's a serious matter. Um, so I, I see, I, 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 I feel that throughout this, this long saga, it's 13 and a half years since we were here, actually, in this club preparing the release of the, uh, the Afghan war diary. The chilling effect that the, the, the persecution of Julian Assange has already had. We've seen raiding even in, in the ABC offices in Australia. Where they, they demanded access to computer to try to find a whistleblower. Unprecedented. Uh, and, and so the examples have been piling up. The damage is, has already been done, but the full damage would be done if it's actually done. So it is so important then to to put the line in the sand. This needs to stop here for it to be reversed. Just to reiterate what Kristen said, this precedent means that any journalist anywhere in the world who's publishing truthful information about the United States could be prosecuted, extradited to be prosecuted in the United States for publishing that information without constitutional protection. And that is a terrifying precedent. So, and it's not just about what, as Kristen said, it's not just about what it means here. And we've seen ads placed in the newspapers here by the unions and free speech groups saying the UK is no longer a safe place for, place for media workers because of Julian's, the extradition case against Julian. Um, but it's what it says about to the rest of the world, as Kristen said, it's diminishing the moral authority of Western liberal governments to raise free speech concerns, but it's also putting people at risk elsewhere. And I want to recognise Jan Dundar, who's here, uh, a Turkish journalist who was imprisoned in Turkey. He was explaining to me, we talk a lot about this, so we talk about the fact that Evan Gerskovich is in prison and Putin says, well, what do you, when Blinken's saying, you can't prosecute a journalist for espionage, he should be released, and Putin says, well, what about Julian Assange? Similarly for Jan in Turkey, when he was imprisoned, Julian's case was raised um, and used as an example by the Turkish authorities about why they can do this. And so it's not just, this is not just about Julian's case, it's not just about the cases that will happen in the future, but it's about what's, what's happening in other cases in different jurisdictions around the world and the precedent that's being used to justify this kind of treatment to journalists. I think we've crossed a threshold beyond which there's no going back if this case goes ahead. And it is a terrifying precedent. We have to stop it. I don't have much to add other than it's a, it's a race to the bottom.
Um, and uh, yeah, the media has, has played a, a very uh, bad role in keeping people ignorant of, like, maybe giving them completely misleading information so that they don't have the elements to really understand it. Um, the other ring with Julian and WikiLeaks and just not really engaging with the with the indictment itself. I mean, you still you still have to, you know, correct journalists who say, "Oh well, this is this is about hacking," and it's just like how how many years of um, of and how many articles and how many explanations and how many how much debunking do you have to do to uh, you know, to get through to them, but um, sometimes I think it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. There are some journalists that are going to be hacks, and arguments are just kind of deployed as, as weapons, um, and if you shoot that weapon down, they'll just come up with another, and it's just positional. It's just basically projecting their alliance to, um, to, you know, power, basically, um, and in fact, they don't, those specific journalists who are hacks, um, don't want to hear the, they don't want to engage, they're not interested, because uh, they see their role as further the interest, furthering the interests of that power. Yeah, I think that's an important point. Unfortunately, you know, at elite institutions like the New York Times, it's a fairly high percentage, and, and it's not just furthering the interests of power, it's furthering their own careers, um, because that's how their careers advance. And if they actually do journalism, they become a management headache. Um, Could you tell us, Chris, I mean, we, uh, in my formative years, I mean, I, I still revere the, uh, the, the New York Times for you know, the role in the Pentagon Papers, which you mentioned here, Daniel Ellsberg. Um, may he rest in peace. Um, it, he come, came over here in, in 2010 in October before the Iraq release, and uh, uh, I met him at the home of, of Gavin McFadden, uh, another great supporter of the this great leader that has passed. And I, I recall how, how energized he was. I was like in his 20s, he was like, running up and down the stairs, and he just couldn't control himself and saying, I've been waiting for this for 40 years, finally, finally. <coughs> and he just he couldn't sit down. And it's like, you know, you just got a plane from America. He just was so energized by what was going on. He was so supportive. But he, he told me as well, if I was, I was going to, to this, through the same thing as I did in the 70s, early 70s, 71, um, I would never have seen, in the today's system, I would have never have seen a, 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 a single day as a free man. It, we have totally changed. And it was, a, it was an eye-opening for me that you would, we were at a worse state than in the darkest hour under the Nixon administration. That's how corrupt the system is. And that's how lame the media is. And another issue that has been raised here was about the endless fight to correct the misconception which comes even from our media partner who know better. For example, there was this irresponsibility about throwing out the information, uh, uh, data dumping, putting lives at risk, picking up the, the talking point of the, uh, of, of the Pentagon uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the uh, American administration. Nothing is further from the truth. Nothing is further from the truth. And, you know, before the publication of the Afghan wars, Julian was working tirelessly night and day to do harm minimization, redacting 15,000 of the entire documents of the Afghan wars. And, and Mark Davis, an, an Australian journalist and lawyer, was actually following him around in these rooms here, and uh, uh, the rooms that Juan supplied us. Thank you very much for that one. Have you paid the bill? No. <laughs> uh, and, and he has testified. He was witness to the fact that the media partners had no interest in the reductions. They thought it was a nuisance. 
that the adjuli was taking it too far. The same thing applied in the October release of the uh, Iraq wars in a bigger media alliance, which I partly had to manage with some herding cats. We had to postpone a demand to postpone the release, and we did for two weeks because we were not finished with the, re the, the reduction process. I just want to close before we open to questions. I think we can't leave without talking about the physical and psychological cost to Julian, which has been immense. I don't think very many of us, probably any of us in this room, could endure what he's endured and maintain uh, his integrity and <coughs> strength the way he has. Um, I think Niels Melzer, what do you call it, a slow motion execution? It's just, you know, a, along with egregious violations of judicial norms, um, they have used the punitive power that they have going all the way back to his seven years at the embassy. And the reason he was seven years in the embassy is because the British government would not allow him free passage to the airport. That's why he was there. And I guess, Stella, maybe you can just address that before we get questions. Well, I think the, the very the massive impact this has had on Julian, um, it's been a, a constant decline because uh, what I, and I really see it when I see footage from, you know, five years ago or eight years ago, ten years ago, I mean, the, the decline is steep and he's he aged <coughs> prematurely. How could you not? Um, you don't know the full extent of the impact on his physical health, his uh, psychological state is a constant struggle. Uh, there have been very, very dark moments inside Belmarsh. Uh, and we're going into a, a very difficult week as well, uh, which always comes with stress and sleeplessness and um, It's, uh, you know, it's, there's never a, a time of recovery in the middle of this. It's just one battle and then getting through it and then <clears throat> decline and a further battle and getting through it and decline. Um, and uh, five years in, in Belmarsh is, no one can deny the... The harsh um, treatment that, that Julian is being subjected to just indefinitely into the future in the worst possible environment in the, in the UK prison system. Um, but he's, he is uh, helped by the enormous support there is, you know, and the knowledge that that support is growing, that there's initiatives all over the world, really, um, the Australian Parliament, um, honorary citizenships in Rome, the journalistic community in Europe, giving him, you know, membership for the Bulgarian and the Serbian and the Italian and the um, German uh, journalists union. Uh, declaring that he's one of them. Uh, all of these things are so important and keep him going, of course. Great, so we can do about a half hour or so of questions. Just keep the questions short uh, so other people can ask questions. Um, I was interested when you talked about all the redacting of the documents. Because I remember a few years ago, Lots of newspapers were talking about insulting, about irresponsible dumping, um, agents' lives put at risk. Is that rubbish? 
Well, if, if you don't believe me, you should believe. The, the, no, no. Let me finish. Let me, let me finish. You should you should believe the uh, uh, the the witness of the government in the Chelsea Manning case, who had to admit under oath that there was no uh, evidence of anybody being physically harmed as a result of this release. And now, 13, 13 and a half years later, 14 years later, we haven't heard of any uh, any damage. There was great effort put into to this process. And uh, to this date, we have not, not heard anything. But it was a propaganda point. He's a hacker, irresponsibly dumping information on the internet. Nothing is further from the truth. Thank you. Um, I've got two questions. Um, one of them, could you explain for non-lawyers why um, this case can't go to the Supreme Court? That's, that's the first question. Um, the second question is a bit more complicated. Um, I noticed too, after the various judgments on, on the case, that if you look on social media, much of the response has come from as it were, continental journalists, not British journalists, um, with a background in countries where lack of free speech is just about within living memory. If you look around the audience here tonight, this is a different audience from quite a few. When I come to the Frontline Pub, if you come to something about Gaza, you will find that pretty much everybody is under about 35. Are you looking at, as it were, a a free speech generation that has no successors and do you think and as a sort of sideline to that do you think that the um, the sex accusations from Sweden um, did they have an effect on a particular generation that has made you leave? Thank you. I'm happy to take the first question about the Supreme Court. Uh, we were refused permission to appeal. Basically, the, the, the High Court will hear, but you don't get permission, you don't get, um, you can't appeal as a right, you have to seek permission to appeal. Uh, we sought permission to appeal on the decision, for example, that the courts waived through the US assurance. I think that was a great point for the Supreme Court. We were not, they did not want to hear us. Um, we now are waiting to see if we get given permission to appeal. It may well work its way up to the Supreme Court, and we think we have a number of really important legal points that de that deserve Supreme Court consideration, but whether or not we get there is a separate question. But if we refuse permission, that is it, and we have to go to the European Court. It's just the nature of the appeal process in extradition cases. Um, on the... On the uh, I mean the the honest answer to to that is that the Guardian has played a very serious case uh, for many years in undermining um, public understanding of Julian's case and it goes down to the um, publication of cable games and the publication of the password that then led to the unredacted cables appearing online on the third-party website, and then the Guardian had to give, blame someone, and uh, the evidence was there um, that it was in their book. Um, they were to blame, and they uh, deflected by smearing Julian and getting the other partners to smear Julian as well, essentially. Um, and so without the uh, liberal left and of course the Swedish allegations were pumped up uh, to play into that and the Guardian gave it a lot of um, fan uh, fans that, that fire um, uh, it undermined political support also because the Guardian viewed Julian as a, as a competitor and WikiLeaks' reputation as an existential threat to the to the viability of the Guardian in the longer term. Um, WikiLeaks came about at a, at a time. This is a more generalized problem 
um, that WikiLeaks came about at a time when, when the mainstream press was uh, struggling to find a, a viable funding model. And here came WikiLeaks, which much, with much greater impact, with much higher quality sources, um, and uh, basically blowing, blowing all these legacy media out of the water. So they had to, um, they had to destroy his reputation. Uh, so, you know, you see all these half, these unenthusiastic defenses of Julian, like, oh, doesn't matter what you think about the man, all that is uh, not just cowardly, but it's also to cover up for how they've engaged in um, putting him in prison, essentially dereliction of duty, allowing their self-interest uh, to uh, making him pay with his life uh, for their uh, selfish um, self-preservation. However, I have to say, um, It's been late in the day, but they are on side. You know, they've made this joint statement. They are clearly, you know, saying Julian should be released. They have enormous influence, and so uh, I don't. You know, I I I, I pick my moments uh, to to really uh, express what I truly think, which you know, of course, this will be there for for posterity. So. Uh, but that's the truth, you know. This hasn't come out come about by coincidence. This isn't a situation of Julian's own making. And just on the Swedish stuff, you should read Neil Smelser's book on this. On Reddit, yeah, it it's great. And you know, he's a lawyer. He speaks Swedish. And it was fascinating about Melzer is that he admits at the beginning that he fell for a lot of this garbage. I, I would just draw an analogy. I was Ralph Nader's speechwriter, and Nader terrified the Democratic Party, and so they did the same thing to Ralph. And what they do is essentially create what Noam Chomsky calls these thought-terminating cliches. And then the press, which is, and I come out of the press, it's a superficial entity, uh, uses these thought terminating cliches as shorthand and um, that became very effective in turning Ralph who I think is one of the greatest American figures of, you know <laughs> the last generation uh, into a pariah and they know very well what they're doing and they did the same thing to Julian but I think the, that I don't know what Stella thinks but I think Melzer's book is uh, really, if for people who really want to understand what they did, I think it's probably a, the best that I know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, also information in, in Stefania Morici's book. Yeah, hers Italian. is very good, but hers is different. It's different, but she is exposed through her uh, documents as you got through uh, FOIA, uh, how politicized the entire side yeah. was, and it should have ended you know, in 2012, or 13, when actually the Swedes wanted to, to get out of it. Because, uh, it you know, this is absurd. And we're pushed onwards <coughs> by the Crown Prosecution Service in this country. Yeah, Wait, Steph so Stefani's I book is very good too, I should imagine. I see Neil Smeltzer's book is a deconstruction, mm -hmm. and Stefani Maritz's is a reconstruction yeah, that's with a documents point. and yeah. forensic detail. Mm -hmm. Got the mic? Okay. Yeah. No, it's fine. Um, I did recording, so I want you to talk to the mic. Um, question for Jennifer. You know, Sam's the assurances that the U.S. Um, sort of gave um, the U.S. on the team. That's not arguable. That's not an arguable point of law because they can all change that, right? Whereas um, Judge Prince, uh, she's she gave Julian a positive um, ruling that the 
because I'm a husband and make for suicide. That is more weight than the Sam's assurances, for example. So how come Julian doesn't win on that point? Because ECHR is only territorial in Europe. Once Assange goes to US, they don't have to listen to ECHR. They will <coughs> Sam will disappear overnight, so they can do whatever they want there. So my question to you is, is that why wouldn't ECHR listen to Julian Assange's application on sort of health grounds, suicide grounds, for example? Because Sam's is not arguable it's not an arguable point of law. It cannot be. It's not law. So why wouldn't they? And plus this is the biggest case in publishing in the last hundred years, even two hundred years. No one has ever done this. No one will ever do this. This is this is once not in a lifetime, it's once in a generation. And I do disagree with you. I think they will listen, but it depends on how the application is put forward. And I really, really think this is the strongest point. Because in all the proceedings, this is the only point that has favoured Assange. And that is um, Judge Vanessa's ruling on this. And she she did a massive favour by them because I I believe that it was a conscious... Okay, let, let's get Jennifer to respond, because oh, yeah. other people want to ask questions. Thank you. Well, the first thing to say is that we did seek to appeal um, that point. As I said, we didn't get permission to appeal on, on the question of diplomatic assurance. That will absolutely form part of our European Court of Human Rights application. So uh, that point was, as the lawyers in the room will know, we need to exhaust domestic remedies before we can apply to Europe. We exhausted domestic remedies on the point of the medical evidence about the, the impact of the prison conditions on Julian if he needs to be extradited. That point is waiting in the wings, as it were. So once we've exhausted all domestic avenues of appeal on all the other points we have, we have a, a European Court of Human Rights application ready to go, which will absolutely be raising those issues along with free speech, fair trial. In the back, there's someone... Thank you. Alexis de Schwab, lawyer at the Brussels Bar and Vice President of the International Federation for Human Rights, the FIDH, who came to London to support the case of Julian Assange because it's a human rights case and the defense of our fundamental liberties. My question is a legal question about the European Court of Human Rights. If uh, we have to ask a Rule 39 to stop the extradition, if the case is end badly here tomorrow and the day after, uh, we know the UK government doesn't like the European Court for Human Rights, but do they respect the uh, decisions of the European Court of Human Rights? We know other countries in Europe, Belgium, my country, extradite a person 10 years ago to the United States, <laughs> despite the Rule 39 that, forbid, what the, that was the, to forbid the Belgian government to do it, but they did it. Um, what about the UK? Government, do they respect it or we don't know? <laughs> I certainly hope the British government will respect Julian's ability to apply to the European Court before extraditing him and will respect any ruling of the European Court as it stands. But of course, we've been hearing some pretty concerning political noises from the British government, mm. and it's certainly something that I hope the Australian government will be making clear its expectation that Julian, as an Australian citizen, will be allowed the available remedies under the, the existing law, which is that we should be permitted access to the European Court and be given time to do so. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chip Gibbons. I think some of you know me. Um, my question is... Vault 7 and how that sort of warped the CIA's perspective of WikiLeaks as a non-state hostile intelligence agency brought up. A few weeks ago, the person who was convicted of giving Vault 7 to WikiLeaks received the longest sentence under the Espionage Act by decades uh, in a civilian court. In seeking this sentence, the U.S. government sought a terrorism enhancement under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and argued that his actions were more like, and argued his actions were more like people who gave evidence to hostile governments. They compared him to Richard Hannison and, and Albert Eames, two actual spies who were not charged under the part of the espionage act. He was. Is there any fear that this sentence in this sentencing memo 
is about cementing the view of WikiLeaks as a sort of analogous to a foreign, I know they're not, analogous to a foreign intelligence agency, and are we concerned with what that means if Assange is extradited to the U.S.? Well, of course, we were, uh, uh, I've been watching those proceedings uh, from a distance, and I worried about his, uh, his length uh, of, of imprisonment that uh, the, uh, the person will have got in this case. Um, uh, Stella, you were, you were, uh, opinion on this? Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the concerns that we we're raising, uh, one of the arguments that we're raising is that uh, the U.S., once Julian is on U.S. soil, could seek to re-categorize uh, the specific um, charges that he's, that he's been extradited under uh, and seek such uh, enhancements, including, as co of course, under the Espionage Act, uh, there is a death penalty um, under some some of the um, provisions of the Espionage Act, uh, and that could be done once he's extradited. I mean, once once he's extradited, if he's extradited, uh, anything can happen. Yeah, I mean, uh, technically, they could add on to the indictment. They would only have to need uh, a rubber stamp from London, which I suspect would be easy to get. Yeah. Uh, Jen? Yes, I think you're absolutely correct, Chip, that this sentencing is incredibly worrying about not just because it was an alleged WikiLeaks source, so we're obviously following it very closely, but for what it signals about where the courts are going in terms of sentencing for Espionage Act offences. And so for the US, for example, the, uh, in this case, the US made a representation in court that Julian would only face five years in prison was the representation made before the court. That is absolutely not what the sentencing guidelines in Julian's case provide. We know that it will be significantly longer. Um, and this, this latest sentence that's been handed down is incredibly worrying about where the courts are going and what Julian would face. Of course, we've never seen a prosecution and publisher under the Espionage Act, but the fact that a source is receiving this kind of sentence is really worrying. And terrifying for the United States. Okay, good. Uh, I'm just going to no, no, use the mic. Mic, the recording. Yeah. Uh, if Julian Assange is a spy, then who he spy for? I mean, uh, if I remember right, I think Chelsea Manning was charged with aiding the enemy, right? So I'm assuming I, I don't really know the law. But uh, you, you think that this is about providing information to a government, but if everything about WikiLeaks and if everything about Julian Assange is providing information to the public, then legally, can you not work it into the legal defence in some way, or can you not work it into the legal defence in some way that the government is declaring the public to be the enemy? <laughs> Just on the Chelsea Manning trial, which I sat through, the argument that the prosecution made was that by providing that information, it ended up in the hands of Al-Qaeda. Um, that it may not have been the intent, but that that was the result. That was Chelsea Manning. That's right. So the aiding the enemy charge in Chelsea's case came because, because she gave the material to WikiLeaks and WikiLeaks made it public by that. Because it was made public and made available to the public, it was also made available to the enemy. And it, you're right, it's a stretch, but this, this is why we say this, the Espionage Act was never intended. It's an antiquated piece of legislation 19, dating to 1918, not intended to apply to publishers or journalists. There is no suggestion in this case that WikiLeaks was operating with the backing of or in support of a foreign power, which is the basis of what espionage is all about. Not at all. This is purely about publications. So the, the Espionage Act was never intended to apply in this way, to journalists or otherwise. So it's, it's absurd. You're absolutely right. I mean, if, if WikiLeaks was aiding the enemy, that must mean that the, <laughs> the, enemy's the, the enemy is the people. <laughs> one specific government, anyway. Well, of course. Go ahead, you can pick. Oh, sure. 
I want to ask a question. Sorry, I apologize for my native language is Spanish. I but I, I have two questions. Uh, the first one: How do you manage to keep in secret your your relationship because you told that the, uh, all the movement is not being recorded? The second <laughs> one, the second question is about uh, how do you handle? Sorry, because I tend to see the legal framework from outside, from Latin America. And for me, I don't understand how it's working, this tradition in this country, because if you <laughs> compare the Augusto Pinochet case and Julia Assange, I don't understand a thing is political, <coughs> more than legal. Um, <coughs> do you have any political support? Are you expecting any political support um, from here or from outside? And my third question, about the documents, uh, can we expect maybe in the future to to know all, every, all the content about the documents? Oh, I don't know. <coughs> uh, well, um, <laughs> keeping it secret from whom, I guess, is the question. Um, we, we never uh, assume that that um, the people who were surveilling Julian inside the embassy with sophisticated de devices uh, didn't know, um, but um, we we tried our best to stay out of the um, places where there were cameras and uh, and um, you know. Um, I mean, Julian is a is a security expert, um, so he so it, it maybe it's uh, might seem extraordinary uh, from a perspective of someone who leads a normal life, um, but you have to understand the the context within that embassy was very um, very specific. Uh, um, constant surveillance, uh, but you find you find a way to to um, to live your life. Um, you asked a question about political support. Uh, we have been um, we have been seeking the support of the Australian government for many many years, and it's. With this most recent government, the under Prime Minister Albanese, we have the full support of the government. So uh, it took many a decade of lobbying in Canberra and uh, an amazing amount of community support. There's some great community organisers in Australia who have been uh, constantly banging down the doors of local MPs. When I go to meet ministers in Canberra, they tell me that they their offices are blanketed with free Assange stickers and people turn up at their constituents' offices asking them what they're doing, and it's made a difference. So just this past week, I want to recognise Julian's brother Gabriel, who's here, who's been doing a lot of work in, in the parliament in Australia and in the community organising space, not just in Australia but around the world, he and John Chipton, Julian's father. Uh, but we've just had a resolution in Australian parliament last week passed by two-thirds of the parliament, supported by the prime minister and the government, calling on the UK and the US to allow Julian to return home to Australia. And I can tell you that that is a huge change. I used to address rooms of three MPs, briefing on Julian's case when I first started going to Canberra more than 10 years ago. And now when we go down, standing room only. We have support from every single political party. It is a bipartisan issue in Australia. So the Liberal Party, the leader of the Liberal Party came out and said that enough is enough. We support the government's position that this needs to come to an end. And then the question is, now that we have the Australian government's support, the Australian Parliament, the government, the Prime Minister, the government, the Parliament, the people, what will the US do with that? We have a special relationship. What does that special relationship mean? And if we look historically, with the support of the Australian government, for example, there was an Australian in Guantanamo Bay, David Hicks, who was accused of terrorism offences. Uh, a conservative Australian government under John Howard negotiated his release and return to Australia. And what I continually have been saying to Australian governments of both political persuasions and to this government 
if we can negotiate the release of an Australian Guantanamo Bay, then why can't we negotiate the release of an award-winning Australian publisher? And I think that's the question, and I think it's a test of the Australia-US relationship now. And it's worth mentioning then, of course, the, 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 the importance of the support of the Albanese government, of the Australian government, and the bipartisan support that we now have in, in Australia is extremely important. Um, but the support has also come from, from other countries outside the bubble of the NATO bubble or the AUKUS bubble. Five eyes, five eyes. Five eyes bubble. Okay. Uh, from Latin America, for example, where uh, the, the presidents of five countries have, have, have issued statements, uh, have uh, met us, uh, Obrador in Brazil, uh, in, in Mexico, Pedro in Colombia, Lula in Brazil, and uh, Kirchner and uh, Fernandez in Argentina, who are now left. And the Bolivian president, uh, Arce, it, it's, it's wonderful. I traveled to the region and it was uh, astonishing to, to, to see the level of support, not just on the top level of, of, of politics, in, in all the major countries south of the US borders, in not just the South America, but you know, one third of North America as well. Uh, and President of Honduras, they raised the issue of the United Nations. Uh, Lula in the General Assembly uh, issued uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, questions of, of, of Julian uh, in, his, uh, in his speech, there, the first speech there, uh, and got a, a, an ovation, which is very rare in the General Assembly. So, and I, I don't know where the conference, but my suspicion is that it's because of in living memory uh, in those countries. You don't have to tell, you don't have to, have to sell them stories about the capabilities of the CIA. They know, mm -hmm. and they know dictatorships. And they know what it means to be deprived of human rights, and that is that continent, and in other countries as well outside this region, we've had tremendous support. But what does it mean in the end? Well, we see in the current, current conflict in, in the, that, that even though 150 nations unite on a, on a uh, single issue, like the, the ceasefire issue in Sri Lanka, it, it is not enough. But it is, in many ways, you know, the support is huge, uh, but we need more push and we need the public out. We have time for like one or two more questions, or two. Yes, two more questions. Two more questions. I'll just let you whoever. Thank you, Jennifer, for mentioning my case. Well, I want to ask something about Joe Biden. Um, I was jailed because of the news story I made in Canada. It was about uh, Turkish intelligence service smuggling arms to Syria to the Islamist jihadists there. And they asked two life sentences and put me in jail because of espionage charges and uh, state secrets act, etc. And uh, and I was called as Turkish Assange by the Turkish media. Um, there are a lot of similarities. I was in solitary confinement, and uh, one day Joe Biden was in Turkey and wanted to meet with my family. My son and my wife met with him and during that meeting he said to my son that you can easily told, uh, tell the reporters outside that your father is a hero and uh, you must be proud of him and he did this meeting and the same Joe Biden now is trying to uh, get the extradition decision uh, from the UK so what has happened I mean uh, the same Biden, what, uh, I mean, was it about, um, it was Turkish intelligence service, not the American intelligence service, is that the reason why he was so, you know, talked about heroism in journalism cases, or uh, he changed during that time? Uh, start with Biden. Um, <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's what Chomsky calls this process of worthy and unworthy victims. So there were four stories in the New York Times about Navalny yesterday. There were none about Julian. And as a reporter, I think the Navalny story is important. And um, 
my suspicions are, what everyone's suspicions are about what happened to him. Um, but he's a worthy victim, and Julian is not. So uh, they, these governments need that moral imprentur, that moral veneer, and so they will use, quote-unquote, worthy victims uh, to give themselves that imprentur while persecuting unworthy victims. And the starkest example in my own career, I covered the war in El Salvador for five years, and we had four American church women uh, raped and murdered by the National Guard. We had Oscar Romero was assassinated. Um, and at that same moment, there was a Polish priest with solidarity who was killed presumably by the communist government of Poland. This was during the Reagan administration. So you had church people killed in El Salvador at the same moment that you had a Catholic priest killed in Poland. All the Reagan administration did was talk about the Polish priest. Um, and in fact, cast even though they were Americans, cast aspersions on the church women uh, Jean Kirkpatrick, who was at the UN, said they weren't really church women, and Alexander Haig, who was the Secretary of Defense, said that they ran a roadblock. So it, it's, there's no moral crisis within Joe Biden. Um, you were a politically deemed a worthy victim, and Julian Assange is an unworthy victim. It's a very cynical game, but as a foreign correspondent for 20 years, I watched it play out over and over and over. And that, so nothing happened to Joe Biden. Um, he's, he's the same shit he always was. Hey! But thank you, Joan, for raising your case and pointing out the hypocrisy. Yeah. And I think we have to continue to point out that hypocrisy, which is if, you will, if you're willing to step in and, and help you be released from prison, in such similar circumstances, then why are they doing this? And that's one of the things we continually do in our public advocacy, certainly in our public advocacy, is highlighting the hypocrisy of the United States in raising cases like yours elsewhere in the world, but doing it at home and doing this to Julian. So thank you for thank you for telling us about it. Just yes, so a word about uh, Joe Biden uh, and uh, hypocrisy and <laughs> consistency. <laughs> The biggest argue, one of the biggest arguments in, in Julian's case is the fact that it, his extradition is in total, total contravention to the extradition treaty between the two countries, the US and the UK. Uh, Article 4, is it? Uh, it? It just totally bans extradition for political offenses, and if any offense can be called political, <coughs> it's HR, so espionage, right? Uh, so it should be impossible to, uh, to, uh, to carry out extradition on this, on this, this basis. And it was pointed out to me, I was sent an article from the Belfast Times, uh, pointing the fact that, that in, in 1984 or 5, then Senator Joe Biden felt so strongly about the political exemption in the extradition treaty that he fought tooth and nail uh, against uh, an, an agreement between Ronald Reagan and, uh, and Margaret Thatcher for America to extradite a suspected IRA terrorist. So he fought in the Senate against it because the exemption was so holy as a rule that even the bad guys should not be extradited. It, it, should, it, was, a, it was a golden rule that should not be touched. But he's Irish. Yeah, he, would be. he was Irish. <laughs> so he was successful in that. And, 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 and the, the, this, this individual, I think his name was Wallace, was not extradited to the UK. So, and there are documents talking about this... Uh, this uh, <coughs> importance of this golden rule. And it's the United States who demands this exemption in all their bilateral agreements. So and, and be consistent. <laughs> Senator Biden, President Biden. And it, you don't have to do that or go that far. I mean, Biden was the vice president in the Obama administration that decided not to pursue. So not to discontinue the case against Julian that the Trump administration started. Is a political decision itself. Um, mm. One last question. Yeah. 
there's someone over here. You can decide. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, Andre Ungo, I'm uh, from the Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe. It's three times called for the immediate release of Julian Assange, and this assembly is linked to the court in Strasbourg. So I will come back to the question of the, the court. Uh, and I think we have to say very clearly, ignoring Rule 39 is, uh, is, um, uh, is, is it's, it's, a, it's a binding law. The treaty is a binding law. Britain has signed it. We should uh, say very clear that this is a breach of international law if Britain would rarely um, ignore Rule 39. I, I asked, I'm a member of the German parliament as well, asked my government two weeks ago if uh, the ignorance of Rule 39 would, would be seen as a breach of the European Convention on Human Rights, and my government said yes, this is a clear breach, this is official, and we have to take into um, mind that uh, the post-EU treaties, part of the post-EU treaties, are um, very sharply bound to the respect of the Convention on Human Rights. Uh, there is a there is a phrase like like this treaty this part of the treaty has to see, shall cease if the convention is breached. So this is I think we should make it strong. I mean I know that we are able to breach it. Of course I know, uh, but I think we should make it as strong as as it possible and not say well it's it's up to the British. Uh, I know that the Tories they want it. They, they have a law now. They try to weaken it, but so far they respect it. Now they respect it in Rwanda, and we shouldn't. Uh, I, I just want to appeal that we should make it stronger uh, uh, and not um, uh, not weaken. So how how you how how how? Um, it's a question to to the lawyer. Uh, how do you see the uh, uh, the binding character of the European Convention on Human Rights? Of course, it's binding as a matter of international yeah. law, and of course, the UK should comply with any provisional measures that are ordered by the European Court. There's no question that that is our position. Our concern is, is the political noises that have been coming from the British government. And so we will continue to reiterate that the European Court is, <coughs> is an avenue of appeal that is available to any, any resident citizen person in this country, uh, and we will be exercising that available <coughs> remedy. And we fully expect the British government to respect its international obligations and comply with it. Great. Thank what you. Else? I hope all of you will be outside the court tomorrow. We need to flood the streets. You make a difference more than you know. Um, the, they, these people who are managing this deep down inside know how corrupt the system is, um, but it's you, uh, all of us, uh, who have the responsibility of calling them out. Thank you. Thank you for coming.